pitch. Hello and welcome to On and Off the Pitch. I hope you're well. A big, big game in the Barclays Women's Championship this weekend. But there's so many. It would be called a top of the table clash between Crystal Palace and Charlton women. Uh, before kickoff, Sunderland, who had played a day earlier, uh, looked down from high, knowing that a result from either team would mean a shift in their position. Uh, Charlton would take all three points in the end, right? But this was a tough game filled with skill, effort, and for some fans watching, the occasional use of magic, also known as the dark arts, or fouling, or diving, or just simply falling over. Anyway, uh, both teams were stacked, absolutely stacked, in terms of the strength and depth on the pitch and off the pitch, the benches were good. Uh, this is where the apprentice invites the master around for tea to illustrate what they have achieved since leaving the fold. I'm talking about the Crystal Palace manager who was formerly with Charlton at some point. So uh, this would have been a very, very entertaining and interesting uh, game for, for both sides of the management uh, side, knowing each other quite well and knowing what was at stake uh, for both teams with regards to wanting to be promoted and where they stood in the overall pecking order of uh, the game itself. It is and was a fantastic game to watch. So I mentioned the, the strength in depth and uh, for both teams, they've had you know, a relatively good season, especially, you know, pre-2024 and uh, uh, good results for both. And the potency of, of their strikers, uh, Hughes for Palace and Johnson for Charlton, you know, have been, you know, relatively good uh, overall. Uh, but in terms of this game, you know, they didn't get the goals. They didn't get the goals, uh, but their hard work for the team was clearly evident. They had endless running. Uh, the link-up play from, from both strikers for their teams were, were very, very good and very uh, and, and evident, you know, for those watching the game. And it was a really good crowd in terms of the turnout as well. The weather helped. The weather helped. And uh, and uh, nice to, to watch football in sunlight and uh, a nice kind of clearish blue sky. Well, clear enough. Uh, Charlton and Crystal Palace, um, you know, they both know their way to goal. You know, they've scored some great goals this season. Chris Palace has scored heavily against one particular team. Um, but um, in terms of this game, like I said, both of those two strikers who probably would have wanted to get on the score sheet because it's a really important game, you know, for these two local friendly clubs that get along so well uh, to see who would um, take the spoils. So in terms of the game itself, the early action, you know, we saw... Um, Corners, uh, successive corners uh, going to the away team, you know, to Charlton. And uh, that happened within the first two minutes. So uh, quite a few corners. And uh, Charlton really did utilise the high press um, that they've used so well this season. I saw it um, a number of times. And the last time I saw it was when they played Blackburn, you know, at home. Uh, and that was a really uh, windy conditions, but they used it really, really well. And the team were well drilled. Uh, their set piece taker Humphreys was on um, on corners and free kicks, uh, and, and in terms of her corners, uh, I'd say the goalkeeper for Crystal Palace, uh, Lambourne, uh, did relatively well considering the number of players around her jostling, pushing uh, to block her path to come and collect. But you know, really, really good composure and um, awareness of what was going on and anticipation when the ball was delivered into the box, so that was good. So. You know, for early parts of the game, I'd say Addison had lots of energy. And and for most players, that when they're playing in such a game where there's lots of energy, you have like dips, you know, you kind of really have peaks where you go up and down. And I'd say the first 25 minutes or so, I said Addison was a real handful. You know, her shot towards goal um, in the first half hit the crossbar. The goalkeeper was fortunate enough that it bounced down. Um, and uh, she was able to collect it despite the the on rush on rushing Charlton player, uh, and um, 
I would also say that Palace, you know, they they it took them a little while to get into their groove, you know, and I'd say the first 25 minutes or so, you know, there are a couple of occasions where they had their pocket picked. Um, one occasion where the ball was um, nicked away from a pl particular player. I'm not sure who it was again, actually. I think it could have been Everett or Nolan, one of the two centre-backs. And uh, the ball was cut back to Mel Johnson for Charlton, but uh, she was unable to convert that opportunity. But, you know, Charlton showed from the kickoff straight away that they had every intention to try and score goals. And Crystal Palace, for their, you know, what they needed to do was contain and contend with a, a very, very good footballing team. Um, uh, yeah, very good footballing team. And and there was one particular moment where I thought that the referee was going to blow up for a free kick um, against, or so, for Charlton. Um, and it did look like a free kick from where I was sat. And I was sat next to someone in the, in the uh, media area and they said that looked like a free kick. But... However, uh, the ref played on and um, this was the theme for the whole game. And, you know, you kind of, and I believe that the ref handled the game very well. I believe that the ref handled the game and took the line that this was a derby and, and as a derby game, there are derby rules, which means contact is permitted. And, and this went for both teams. And what was noticeable that considering the number of challenges and the number of free kicks that were awarded and, you know, for both teams, the only two yellow cards were for dissent, for talking. <laughs> the challenges, we, we had a player go off injured. It was a lengthy injury, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a little while. But considering the challenges that took place in the game, there was a clear holding, pulling, shoving, you know, double team in, you name it, they, they, it was visible. The only two yellow cards were for talking and they were to Charlton players. So, you know, I know that some fans are not happy with the way that the ref managed the game or they believe that the opposition um, fell over. I mean, I suppose if you kicked, you do fall over um, or pushed uh, too easily. Uh, but the referee uh, really did, in my opinion, let the game, let the game flow. She's like, this is a contact sport. You're going to tackle, you're going to challenge, you're going to tackle. You might get into a little bit of physicality, but you know, as long as no one's hurt, play on. It's great. Uh, we saw great bits of skill from both sets of players. Um, I'm always, you know, I, I do like her. For Crystal Palace, Blanchard, she's just so balanced and so, so aware of what's going on. Twinkle toes, vision, balance on the ball, um, just seems to, you know, go across the ground in a really graceful and, you know, kind of airy like manner. She just like skips along, you know, with the ball and always picks the right pass as well. Um, but it was good to see her. Good game. Um, and again, really strange seeing her her uh, leave the field, her substitution in the second half, but it did happen. Uh, for both teams, great defending. I would say that Nolan and Everett for Palace were were fantastic. They really, really were fantastic. Uh, and and Dow and McKenna for Charlton. And every time I see McKenna, I just think, wow. I mean, is there a better fullback? At, and I would say probably there is. And for Crystal Palace fans, they'll probably say, but what about Gibbons? I say, yeah, Gibbons is good. But I would say, in terms of the personnel on the pitch for the first forty-five, up until Godfrey had to leave the, the pitch. Gibbons very rarely supported the attack in the way that I've seen her support the attack for Crystal Palace. Uh, far too busy worrying about what was coming the other way. So I was, was focused on uh, defending first, as opposed to going across the halfway line and supplementing the attack, as she has done so well this season. Uh, Isabel Atkinson on the left for Crystal Palace looks a real threat, looks a player. Looks a player. Um, just wasn't totally utilised enough in the first 45. You know, considering the pace that she has, um, just wasn't enough. The, the, the midfield didn't get the ball to her quick enough. 
And sometimes the midfield didn't get the ball quick enough. Uh, so that, that that was in the first 45. Very different in the second half, but in the first 45, where I felt that um, Atkinson could have exploited areas where she wasn't marked close enough. Um, the ball wasn't was wasn't sent to her, you know, quick enough in that sense. Uh, noticeable as well in the way that Charlton's wide players switch flanks in the game. Uh, Godfrey was on the right to start with and then switched uh, to the left and Addison likewise switched to the right. Um, so they have a set routine in terms of when they switch to give um, the opposition something to think about, which is really, really good. Um, the midfield from Charlton are very, very, very disciplined. Lockhurst and um, Phyllis were fantastic as well. For both teams, Hotcroft as well, um, um, Potter, great. I mean, it was a really good football game. It was a really good game to watch. Um, so I would say, you know, for, for both teams, there were plenty of opportunities to score goals in either half. And I could go on and do the minute by minute and more detail, right? I could overall. But this was a good game to watch. And for both teams overall, the number of possibilities to score uh, were there in both halves. Um, but it would come down to the subs to make an impact, right? A YC, a YC does it. That's what this is. Uh, a Yeezy's quick reaction to her initial shot um, found its way into the top corner of the Palace goal. At that time when Palace actually were on the up, I'd say that they had advantage in terms of ball possession and, and the level of threat that they were posing towards the, the Charlton goal. Um Overall, I would say it was superb effort from both sets of players, not just because of the importance of the game, but also due to the lengthy delay following an injury to Godfrey, who had to leave the pitch on a stretcher. Now, this challenge was about maybe two minutes before the 45th minute. And the challenge was from, from Nolan, I believe. It was Nolan uh, from behind. And it wasn't studs. It was, you know, the ball was in the air. Godfrey's gone to collect it or control it on her chest. There's a nudge behind her. Nolan, I believe, used the shoulder. You know, dark hearts, as they say. Um, and it didn't look like anything. It didn't look from the position. It didn't look like a, a difficult challenge. But no one knows what the injury was. Uh, she was down for a very, very long time. The player didn't move from the position that she was at once she hit the floor. Roughly, she was on her knees, uh, bent over, holding her head or neck. And she didn't move for probably about 10 minutes. Uh, and then it was another 10 minutes, roughly or so. Maybe it was about 10 or 15 minutes that she was on the floor. Stretch came on. Uh, no one knew what was happening. So it was a very lengthy period in which Godfrey was motionless and uh, receiving treatment. The players were doing their best to um, stay warm, keep the ball moving in terms of little kick around. And then they were asked to leave the pitch. And there was some confusion. We thought it would go for half time. Um, by the time they left the pitch, it was the 55th or 56th minute. Uh, but after about 20 minutes break, we were told that they would come back out and play 10 minutes. And then they'd go off for 10 minutes and then come out and play <laughs> the, the second half. So a game which should have ended at 4pm ended at 5. I mean, the crowd stayed good, you know, um, you know, good for them. But it was a, it was a bit of a strange one. Uh, but I will say that the referee and her team, I'll say uh, Miss Sykes is the referee, got the name here. I think she did really well, considering what's been said about Charlton players going over too easy, not saying by instead. I've had a private conversation, private enough, it's on Twitter. Um, I thought the referee, my opinion, let the game flow in terms of a derby. Um, there are challenges. Not every challenge is a free kick. Not every challenge is malicious. Sometimes it is a bit naughty, but the referee understood the game. I think she did really, really well. You know, really well. Um, in terms of Godfrey, uh, the news after the game on the Charlton website is that uh, Godfrey, Fred Godfrey was stable and alert and in good spirits after the injury. Um, and there was an initial scan and there was nothing that they could see at that moment. Nothing would be identified as a fracture. So it was, that was good news to read because it was, you know, when you see a player go off on a stretcher, it's, you know, you just don't know what's happened and you do really hope for them and you want them to be, you want them to be okay. You want them to be good. And because the game in itself is about the scoreline and 
obviously there are difficulties that can happen in the game. Sometimes there are injuries, uh, but the most important thing is that people are able to leave the pitch uh, healthily or, you know, the odd kick, the odd bruise, the odd bump, but, you know, be able to reflect on what they did in terms of their performance for the team and the team performance overall. Uh, a good day had out, I would say, by the fans. I would say the Crystal Palace fans will be upset with the result, but they probably would have understood and watched a really, really good game. The Crystal Palace players, this will hurt a lot longer than normal because they know they played really well and they know that they had to be on their best to match a really good Charlton team. And Charlton were a really, really good team. I've got the team sheets here. I'm going to just pull out a couple of names. I think, as I say, I've already mentioned um, Everett and Nolan. I thought they were fantastic. Um, Molly Sharp had a really good game. Um, Potter, as mentioned. And Blanchard, when she was um, subbed off, she didn't look happy. She had a little shake of her head. You know when a player knows that they're having a good game and they get subbed they, and they don't know why they've been subbed? She didn't look happy. And I was surprised that she was subbed off. And I was also surprised, considering the place of Atkinson, that Atkinson was subbed off as well. Because then Dennis comes on and Dennis plays on the right. Atkinson was on the left. Palace could have had two players on the wing just absolutely pestering the hell out of Charlton. Didn't do it. And they went for uh, something else. But in terms of um, Charlton, I mean, their substitutes come on. I mean, um, who was it that came on for her? Kaylee Green came on uh, to replace Godfrey, did really well. Mia Ross, I remember seeing Mia Ross, I think the first time I saw her this season, right at the beginning of the season, uh, number four, sat in, fact in front of the back four, just basically soaked up everything, cleared it, got rid of it, kept it simple. She came on, so it's probably good to see her coming back and playing for Charlton. That was really good. Um, Addison, I thought was fantastic, non-stop running. Johnson as well, absolutely. I mean, the job that she does for Charlton up front on her own, she doesn't stop moving. And I think the manager has got a lot to do with that. Um, Karen Hills is expecting something from this team and everyone has bought into it. Really, really good. Really, I say really good um, performance. And Ayisi, as I said, Ayisi does it off the bench. Um, fantastic fantastic for uh, for Charlton and they really did celebrate at the end because they knew how, how important this game was for them uh, at this point of the season and what it means going forward and where it could put them at the end of the season. Anyway, uh, enough of that. Let's go and talk about some of the results with the rest of the Barclays Women's Championship. Uh -huh. First, we'll have a cuppa. Mm. Nice. Okay, so in terms of scores on the doors, scores on the doors. That's old, isn't it? Scores on the doors. Uh, no, in terms of the, the league, uh, Blackburn Rovers, they played on Saturday. They were a host to Sunderland, and Sunderland um, did win that game by two goals to nil. Uh, really interesting result. Watford away from home, go to Durham, tough Durham, and beat Durham by two goals to nil. I mean, oh gosh, I mean, really? Wow. Uh, Sheffield United um, at home to Southampton, uh, Southampton win by one goal to nil. Uh, Lewis Redding, Lewis will win in this game at one point, but Redding come back and get a draw. It's 2-2. Uh, they had a player sent off. We know about Crystal Palace and Charlton and Birmingham at played host to London City Lionesses and they win by one goal to nil. So it makes it all very interesting in terms of the league. Charlton on 29 points, uh, Sunderland 28 points, Southampton 27 points. Uh, Birmingham City played a game less on 26 points. So it still could change. Still could change. Crystal Palace, uh, 24 points. Durham, 18 points. Um, and they're in um, sixth place. But it's really interesting. The bottom four, Watford are bottom, nine points. Lewis are 11, um, are just above them, nine points. London City Lionesses, third from bottom, 12 points. Reading, 12 points, uh, just above them. So the bottom four, all squeezed together. Uh, those four teams, Watford, Lewis, London City Lionesses and Reading, better get a move on. It's getting busy down there. It's getting really, really tight. Um, some teams need to get a win. And some teams need to win more. Uh, it's, it's just, it's horrible. Who wants to be down there? 
it's it's just as interesting as the top part of the table because it can all go either way. Um, good for the league, interesting. But as I've mentioned before, Watford have far too many good and talented players to be where they are. They need to do something and it looks like they have begun. So there's that. Uh, let's move on to the Barclays Women's Super League in terms of the scores. Big scores. Big scores as usual. Uh, Brighton will host Chelsea and they they lose by three goals to nil. I believe Lauren James is on the score sheet for them. Uh, Everton lose at home to Leicester by one goal to nil. Uh, Bristol City, uh, they lost that by um, one goal. Um, they scored one, but West Ham, the visitors, scored two. Uh, Manchester United uh, played Aston Villa. I always call this the, the Carl Award interview game, really, because Manchester United fans really do like Carl Award. Uh, Manchester United... Um, I win by two goals to one, but I'm sure that was a very interesting game. Uh, Manchester City keep rolling on um, with uh, a win uh, against Tottenham. Tottenham were at home and they lose by two goals to nil. And Arsenal uh, beat uh, Liverpool, who were playing at home, by two goals to nil. So in terms of the league, Chelsea are doing what Chelsea do. Manchester City are just behind them in a couple of points. Um, they lost one game more. Arsenal in third place. Manchester United in fourth place, so on and so on and so on and so forth, all the way down to the bottom team, which is Bristol. I miss you, Bristol. Come back. I'm joking. I'm joking. That was just a joke. Uh, stay where you are. Uh, stay where you are. Uh, now, I, I don't really say much about the the men's football, but I do occasionally. I do occasionally. But I know that there's stuff happening with Manchester United men's and there's, you know, of one particular player. And I was listening to another podcast conversation. They were talking about a young talent um, possibly going to the to the club, January transfer rumours, etc. And all of that. And and he called it a graveyard. This this person. He called Manchester United a graveyard for young talent. And to be honest, they are pretty much the walking dead of football. Because if I was, I mean, I, I am a father, but I mean if I had a son. And they were talking about going to clubs as a young person. And I know that some people are only interested if you go and get to play professional football, you can go to the club that makes you get them the most money so that you have legacy wealth. You know, it's not about you playing football, that you're, you are rich immediately. But I want my child to go to a club where I, I felt that there was some kind of level of in. So I, the word, I'm going to use the word integrity, but also there's development for, for young people. And I, I look at Manchester United, and they're not alone. Chelsea there as well. They're like the black holes of football. You can't send talent there. You can't send talent to those teams, young talent. They just get sucked. They get, well, so the suck, talent gets sucked out, but what comes out in the end is just you, you just don't you just don't like it at all. You look at it and you think, what the hell is going on there? It's horrible. It's ugly. And there's nothing pretty about what you hear about in the news from those two two clubs in terms of young players and the development or the egos or whatever it is, you know. And whether it's made up by the press and the media and you think, oh, they're just causing trouble. But, you know, for what you do here, it's just not good. It's just not good. So, yeah, it was very interesting listening to this gentleman calling him. Like he said, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a zombies of the... Black, the Walking Dead. You just don't send young talent there at all. You don't. They just end up not being. They don't end up being nice. Anyway, uh, that's that. So uh, that's it for this week. Uh, you know, honestly, the Premier League starts again soon because it's been the FA Cup. Some teams have gone out. Some have stayed in. In terms of the men, it's all much the much same. You know, I think you might think, oh gosh, come on, you you, you talk football, but there's a bit of me that kind of not so much switches off from the men's football, but I do get a bit bored with it. And I think sometimes it's so simple to watch this game and just enjoy the football as opposed to getting pulled into the, the social drama that is beyond the pitch of, you know, whether this player likes that manager or doesn't like that manager or if they're falling out of a nightclub or if they have fathered children outside of their 
normal relationship, which I've just heard this morning, which is the strangest thing I've heard, but it's not the strangest thing. It happens. Anyway, that's enough from me. Uh, this is on and off the pitch. And until the next time, laters.